that I would like to introduce uh, a friend and the Dean of Marshall School of Business. Jeff Garrett is a distinguished international political economist and LinkedIn influencer. He's the Dean of USC Marshall School of Business and joined in July 2020 after six years as a Dean at the Warden School of the University of Pennsylvania. He joined the Marshall School in its centennial years as 18th Dean and is tasked to lead the school through an unprecedented pandemic and the results of upheaval in higher education industry. Jeff returns to USC after having taught three uh, uh, over there as a popular pro professor of international relations, business administration, communication, and law from 2005 to 2008, during which he also served as president of the Pacific Council on International Policy. Jeff is recognized as an expert in world politics, business, and the global economy, as well as on US-China relationship. He held academic appointments at Oxford, Yale, and Stanford University, and is highly sought after the international media for his thought leadership. He holds BA from Australian National University and MA and PhD from Duke University, where he was a Fulbright scholar. Jeff is a, an immense supporter of supply chain and has been a great friend in a short tenure in his vision where he sees the global supply chain management. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Dean of the University of Southern California Marshall School of Business, Jeff Garrett. Jeff, welcome. Thank you, Nick. Um, and it's my pleasure to be here and, and congratulations to you uh, for all that you do, including this extraordinary conference. And, and uh, I'm not surprised that uh, you and everyone has pivoted so effectively to this uh, remote world for, for this year's conference. Um, I, let, me, let me frame my remarks around two things that you just said, Nick. Um, the first one is that I think for us all right now, we have to do a balancing act. We, we're all reacting to the pandemic in real time and we've got to react because things are changing and we've got to keep the trains running on time. But at exactly the same time, uh, I love your John F. Kennedy quote, we've got to be thinking about the opportunities that the pandemic is going to create for the future. So, so that balance between re reactive and proactive, between the tactical and strategic, I think is incredibly important and, and you nailed that. Um, the second thing I think, uh, in, and this is really a baton pass from you to me, if, if I think about the, the biggest forces that have shaped the world in the past 30 years, the two forces are clearly digitization and globalization. They're the two big forces. And you just talked about digitization, and I'm going to talk a little bit about globalization when it comes to supply chain. I think your other theme that the crisis is accelerating trends that were already there is true with respect to globalization and supply chain as well. However, I wanna be a bit controversial and say that the trend that was evident before the pandemic was deglobalization. And that deglobalization is only gonna be accelerated by the pandemic, but it is gonna create a, a bunch of opportunities as you, as you said in response to the question that came in from the floor. So let me see if I can, uh, if I can share my screen now. I've got a very short presentation. I hope we can, I hope everyone can see it. Uh, is that, is this slide now evident to you, Nick, and to everybody yep. else? Yep. Okay, we, so, can see we can see it. So let me start with, with something that I've said to you many times, Nick, and I just believe it which is that you know we hear we hear a lot about globalization since the mid 1980s and it's in all the data but then there's a more complicated question which is is this period of globalization different from the prior globalization epoch the one early in the 20th century and my answer to that question is always yes and the reason is multinational firms and global supply chains and global distribution networks and it's evident in this slide, which breaks, you know, this is a geeky economist slide, and it only goes through 2014, but it makes the point that trade in intermediate products, which is supply chain, 
has always been greater than trade in final products, but that the gap has just opened up dramatically since the mid 1980s. So in the mid 1980s, if you try to look, you know, look across to the left axis there, you'll see that intermediate trade was maybe two points of GDP bigger than final tra uh, trade in final products. By 2014, that gap was now more than 10%. That is, it opened up 500% over that 30 year period. So I think it's really important for everyone who studies globalization to, to decompose trade. It's not about a product made in one country and sold in another country. That's David Ricardo trade from the 19th century. Trade today is about assembling products in some place from components that come from many places and then distributed to the global market, right? So that global supply chains are the defining feature of globalization, I believe. Okay, now let's move to change. Here's uh, something that, that I just pulled from an HBR, Harvard Business Review article that came out uh, very recently. Um, and it, you know, it makes the consensus prediction that manufacturers worldwide are going to be under greater political and competitive pressures to increase their domestic production, to shorten their supply chains, right? And, and I think it is important to note that this is both an economic pressure and a political pressure. So what I'd like to do is just to decompose that a little bit in a couple of slides. So here is my first slide. This is something I just grabbed trade data from yesterday, uh, yesterday for the last four years. So I don't have 2020, even though we've got data through the first part of 2020. And look at what happened. Look at the impact of the trade war, the US China trade war, just between 2018 and 2019 in the pattern of US imports. US imports from China decreased $100 billion in one year as a result of the trade war. And I expect that the, that the drop in imports from China will be greater in 2020 than it was in 2019. And you can already look at the first, the, the data's out through, through August and it shows you that. So let's talk about a $200, million, $200 billion decline in imports from China into the US. Is, is that, is that all of that uh, slack going to be taken up by reshoring in the United States? I don't think so. Um, what I did here was I just looked at three different kinds of alternative supply chain routes for the US. Um, one is a direct, one is, is Vietnam. I think everybody probably knows that story and I apologize for the greens here, but that the hockey stick is Vietnam where just in one year, uh, imports from Vietnam into the United States increased by, by more than $15 billion. That was a one third increase in one year. Again, I'd expect that to continue, right? And, and I think we all know manufacturers in China who say, I've got a hedge. I've just got to create a plan to cross the border in Vietnam because I don't know whether I'm going to be able to utilize my Chinese assembly facility going forward. But notice, notice the two other countries I put here. One is a story that's already started and it's in semiconductors mostly, which is the benefit that Taiwan has received now from, from the, the fact that high tech competition and, and high tech barriers between the US and China are probably gonna go up faster than others. So, you know, Taiwan, which is which has a lot of assembly um, and a lot of semiconductors, is a is a big beneficiary here. Its uh, its import uh, American imports from Taiwan went up ten billion dollars in one year as well. That's the blue line. The sleeping line there is Mexico, the bottom one. Um, so yes, uh, as a result of USMCA plus the trade war, U.S. imports from Mexico have gone up. But th this is backward looking, right? This is backward looking data. The, I want to end by thinking uh, the, the, the conference is, to, is trying to point towards 2025. So let me add a slide which gives me an indication of what's going to happen 
uh, in the future. And this was something that was in, I, I don't know whether, probably a lot of people on this conference get the, uh, the Financial Times trade secrets every day. So this was in trade secrets uh, from the FT just last week. And so I can't vouch for it, but it's really interesting data. So, so the headline here is that if you reshored manufacturing from China to the US, you'd increase price, you'd increase the cost of production by 37.6%. But look on the other side, it says that this slide says that you decrease production costs by 23% by moving to Mexico and by 24% by moving to ASEAN, which, which is Vietnam plus. So let's decompose that. With respect to the US, this is the, this is the thing that I find really interesting about the trade debate in America. We talk about the jobs benefit of reshoring production. We never talk about the cost hit that would be taken even though that cost hit would be taken by consumers. So I think if you, you know, if you asked, a, you know, just do a survey of the American population and you ask them, would you like more stuff made in America again? Their answer is gonna be yes. If you ask the same question, but added, would you like more stuff made in America if it was gonna cost you one third more to buy their products? I bet the answer would be different. And you know th this is uh, this is just a commentary I'd, I'd make on the political debate about trade in the U.S. and made in America. It is so disconnected from the economic realities, and I think we need. I, I think the debate in the U.S. has to be more sophisticated. Now, I'm not going to argue that politicians should get up on stage and say imports are good because they lower prices even though we all know that the economics of that is true. I just, want, I just want a little more nuance around the cost side of Made in America, as well as the benefit side, the job, right? So the cost side is to producers who must pass those costs on to consumers. The benefit side is employment, employment in manufacturing. And, and the political debate only talks about the employment benefit it doesn't talk about the about the supply cost so let's go to the right hand side now why is why is production cheaper in mexico than in china it's that dark crimson band which is tariffs right the trade war in a context where us and mexico have uh, have tariff free trade is just a boon for Mexico. What I think what we're doing right now is driving multinational final assembly into Mexico. Now, Mexico, you know, has an enormous advantage, its geographic proximity, and then it has a whole bunch of disadvantages, which I would broadly put down to the political system. But that cost advantage is an enormous one for Mexico. But note here that Mexico will have to compete with Southeast Asia. Um, and in a world where containerization is cheap, I don't think Mexico necessarily wins in this competition. Uh, you'll have to, the, the countries that want to be the new supply chain for the US are going to have to be able to deliver quality, um, not just proximity and price. So I don't know, you know, we, prediction is hard, particularly about the future. I don't see a scenario in which US China goes back to the way it was pre 2018, 2017. I think decoupling is going to be a reality. You can't do it overnight. I think the pressure on China is a double one because everything that has a commercial application also has a national security implication. And I don't think a President Biden, for example, would go back to where Bill Clinton was on China. I think the US position on China has changed forever because the core proposition that people like President Bill Clinton made was that if we engage with China, it's going to change China. So I don't think anyone credibly can say that anymore. 
So if we want to engage China going forward, we're going to need a new justification for it, which can't be it's going to make China a democracy, which was the core right at the bottom of all US-China policy for 40 years. So I don't know how that's going to shake out, but I don't see that we're going to go back to the future when it comes to US-China, and that's going to have dramatic implications. And I think the implications are evident in this chart. So Nick, I'm going to stop there. Um, I, I was supposed to stop in two minutes time, but I wonder if anything I've said uh, you'd like to react to or anybody else in the audience. No, Dingar, thank you again. And I think we have a couple of questions that I, if you have a few minutes, I would love to ascertain. But let me just start out with a quick question. So I do agree uh, about your assessment on Mexico and then the cost data that you shared from the FT. Uh, what are the distinct disadvantages to Mexico? As I talked about the hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure, uh, especially in the soft infrastructure, the governance, do you think those issues can actually be resolved quickly so that the Mexico can play the role like what China did for the last 30 years? Um, you know, look, these are very sensitive topics, Nick. Um, I do think we, we can't discount hard infrastructure. Um, and, you know, and just the infrastructure advantages that China has are off the charts. I think we all know that. Um, you know, the, just think, uh, you talked about South Asia a little while ago. You know, I, I think there is an opportunity for India, but anyone who spent time in India knows that the infrastructure is, the physical infrastructure is impossible um, and governance is a real challenge in India too. I, I think the same is true by, on both of those dimensions for, for Mexico, not as extreme and geographic proximity and sharing a very large border with the US is an advantage for Mexico. But I don't, you know, I, uh, look, we could go into a, a detailed discussion of the political economy of Mexico. We just haven't seen, I think the last time there was a real pro reform pro-economic reform government in Mexico was the Salinas government, maybe Zadio. So that's 25 years ago. Um, the, you know, the, uh, AMLO, the, the president of Mexico, has a, has a better relationship, I think, with, with the Trump administration than many people would have expected, given his radical left populism as a, as a political candidate. So things are going better in Mexico than I would have anticipated, but, but Mexico is not going to be a business nirvana in the next few years. The, the upside to Mexico is immense, but the, as you said, the, the, the hard and soft infrastructure issues are, are very real.